Next up, we have Mark Corthius, Executive Director of the Mental Health Foundation, whose presentation is going to span the past, present, and future of mental health, explaining why the mental health landscape will look drastically drift different over the next 150 years. Let's welcome Mark. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, that's me as a child. I enjoyed my pablum. Uh, for the past decade, I've been interested in unpacking how uh, mental health intersects with the overall human experience. Um, and as we move forward in the next 150 years as a nation, um, I'd like to explore how we can build mentally healthier individuals, communities, families that are more resilient and inclusive. And as our friends in the South um, have shared with us, words matter, and words matter a lot. And this is particularly true in mental health. The way you talk to somebody that has a mental health issue either affirms, <laughs> I had to get a Trump picture in there, <laughs> either affirms or diminishes their thoughts and feelings and how they go about seeking help. It might surprise you that Abraham Lincoln, when he was the President of the United States, suffered from clinical depression. He suffered for the duration of his life. And at the time, they considered that a character flaw. Uh, my first surprise was in the early 2000s when I was watching TV and a, an anchor you might be familiar with who was on off the record, Michael Landsberg, um, who I thought was charismatic. He was a celebrity, good looking, debatably, we can argue that later, confident. <laughs> shared that he suffered from depression and anxiety, and I was like, what? How could, how could that guy, how could that guy suffer like that? But mental health illness, and mental illness is agnostic. It affects individuals like my friend Tim Hay, who's a lawyer, has his master's degree in law, spent the last 20 years going through treatments of ECT, multiple antidepressants, myriad of psychologists, psychiatrists. It affects families like my cousin Eli, my best friend growing up, the kindest, gentlest soul I've ever known. Eli struggled with addiction and mental health issues throughout his teenage years and in adulthood, and in January, Eli died of a fentanyl overdose. It affects communities like my friends Jim and Tammy Cook Searson in northern Saskatchewan. Tammy's the chief of Lac Lorange Indian Band, one of the largest Indian bands in, in the country, one of the greatest leaders in this country. And in late 2016, Laurence uh, had four girls under the age of 14 die by suicide. So that's what we're up against. And, you know, it's, it's easy to say how far we've come in the last hundred years where we're no longer institutionalizing those with mental illness, uh, calling them crazy, putting them in asylums, insane hospitals. But let's not forget that it was only in 1950 that the lobotomy won the Nobel, Nobel Prize for medicine, which is essentially sticking a needle through your, your eyelid into your brain to sever your brain connections, essentially making the patient uh, go into a vegetative state. The 1960s, 70s, 80s saw us deinstitutionalize mental health, uh, the birth of, of pharma, pharmacycology, antidepressants, to where we're at in more recent days where we talk about stigma reduction. And while the Bell Let's Talk campaign has done a tremendous job with respect to reducing stigma and allowing space for individuals to seek out help, um, ironically, it's caused an increase uh, in the need for services in an already strained uh, mental health care system. The next generation, Generation Z, I think we call it, much more open to talk about mental health issues, much more open to receive help, but they have their own uh, issues to deal with and stressors, technological, social media. What we do know, uh, sorry, what can we do from here? What we do know is uh, mental illness is predominantly a biological disorder that affects the brain. There are, there are treatments available. Medications do help a lot of people albeit not all. There's a lot of people that 
don't want to take medications as well. Uh, talk therapy, psychotherapy, has been proven to be as, as effective as medication, and even more so. Sorry, my psychologist friends didn't like this picture, so forgive me, but it was a 1,024 by 768. Um, <laughs> but it's not publicly funded. And those who, need, those who have money can access those services. Those who don't, the lower income families in our communities, the ones more likely to need help, can access those services. So we have two arrows in our quiver, one of which half the people can only take, and one of which you can't access if you don't have the money. So that's where we're at, but where are we going? And where should we be going? There's a number of new uh, and exciting treatments that are on the horizon, and I'm gonna talk about a few of those. First, I just wanna, I just wanna say again on the psychotherapy aspect, that is something that can, should, and will be funded uh, by government over the coming, coming years. Technology, <laughs> technology is also going to play a critical role, not only for e-mental health solutions, but particularly for remote communities um, that don't have access to a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Brain stimulation is revolutionizing mental health care. Brain stimulation, this is Dr. Frank McMaster from the University of Calgary. Um, is non-invasive, no side effects. It uses magnetic, magnetic stimulation to um, activate parts of the brain where depression lives. And I'm just going to leave you with just one little anecdote about the lizard brain. This creepy little photo here that uh, I spent 18 hours drawing. No, it's not mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> you may know about the lizard brain, but the lizard brain is the primal instinct of fear. The fear not to speak up against something, the fear not to seek help, the fear not to do a presentation. It's an irrational fear, and I challenge you all, sorry I'm going over time, but I challenge you all, whether it's today, in a week, in a month, in a year, to squash that lizard brain whenever you have a fear. Whether it's, I don't want to go to the networking event tonight because I'm fear, fearful of, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm not smart enough. Um, I want you to challenge, ch challenge yourself to squash that lizard brain. Thank you.